Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our online service at Kitsap Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. I invite you to follow along in our order of service. You'll see the link there in the chat. Whoever you are and wherever you have come from, for this hour, we are one gathered congregation and all are welcome. My name is Lisa Johnson. I am currently co-president of our KUUF Board of Trustees. My husband Mac and I are longtime members. Um, we came as a young family looking for something for our son and found something truly wonderful for ourselves. We are so grateful for the beloved community we have here at KUUF for the services, for the neighborhood groups, for the music from Brian and Mike and Lena that always brings us joy. So thank you for being here today. Our worship leader is our own beloved minister, Reverend Jessica Starr Rockers. And I'd like to offer to welcome um, any visitors. Please introduce yourself there in the chat room. We welcome more interaction with all during our after service Zoom coffee hour. The link for the coffee hour will appear in the chat. You'll have to use the password coffee with a capital C to be admitted to the coffee hour. We also have two other events happening after the service. We have a children's chocolate hour um, that will happen to allow children a chance to gather and, and um, enjoy each other's company. And we have our monthly adult RE. Look for the um, links for both of those uh, also in the chat. Now, I'd like to introduce our own Nathaniel Stewart Haskell, who will read our land acknowledgement. My name is Nathaniel, and I am a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe of the Lakota people. We would like to start today by acknowledging that the land on which we all live is the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish, the Skalalum, and the Skokomish people. They have lived in harmony with the lands of waterways along Washington Central Salish Sea for thousands of years. These tribes still live here and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliot and Point No Point Treaties of 1855. Good morning. What wonderful music and what nice announcements that have been here so far. My name is Jill Claridge, and I'm happy to be co-chair with Peter Kreidler of the Stewardship um, drive this year. I like to write that stewardship letter that you all received in the mail. It makes me think deeply about our accomplishments and our expenditures during the year. The point is, I don't like to waste money or resources. I reduce, I reduce, reuse, and recycle. I like a good value. You do too. KUUF is a good value. And that's why I give to KUUF. As you know, paper is just, money is just paper and metal or electrons. And um, it's, what is important is what we do with money. We use it to feed and clothe and house ourselves. But we also want to use it to make the world better, to make the world more kind, more equal, more just. KUUF helps us to do this and so much more. KUUF provides community for all of us. This um, is important for everyone at critical times and for us now during the pandemic times at all times. For me, I appreciate the way KUUF allows us to maximize the spread of our values in the wider community. This can be with our social justice actions. It is also by encouraging us to grow and making us more aware and educating us to rise be above what we were last year. Even more important for me is that KUUF provides a mechanism to trans 
commit our values to the next generation and through our children's, primarily through our children's RE. Yes, I have tried to instill these values to my children and grandchildren, but I feel that these values will be even more dependably carried on to the next generations and the one after that by having a thriving UU presence in Kitsap County. Now, you know, this is the last week of the formal stewardship drive. Many of you have already submitted your pledges, but during this month, you have heard how essential KUUF is and how important it is that we all, how important all the work that we do is to the community. So now for those people, you may wanna pledge more. The good news is I've checked with the, our bylaws and with the IRS and uh, yes, the answer is yes, you can give more. If you want to. Now, for those who have not yet gotten around to pledging, uh, re really returning the pledge form, and I can't stress how, how, uh, great enough, really return the form. Remember that the pledge is confidential and all amounts and all combinations of the time, talent, and treasure are needed and appreciated. You should all be profoundly proud of what you do for KUF and proud of your contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. And now I would like to introduce our musical call to worship, number 1051, We Are, sung by Alina Hemingway with Brian Kenny and Mike Menifee. And that will be followed by our Morgan Emmett, who will be reading the children's chalice lighting words. Thank you. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born.
I honor you peace. I honor you friendship. I honor you love. I honor you love. I see your teeth. I hear your heat. I feel your feelings. My wisdom comes from I honor that source in you. Let us work together. Thank you so much, Morgan, for that wonderful chalice lighting. Now, please join us in singing our opening hymn, number 1040, Hush, by Alina Hemingway, Brian Kenny, and Mike Menifee. Please join me in our spoken affirmation printed here on your screen. We gather as a caring community seeking life's deeper meanings. We value diversity and affirm the worth of all living things. We strive to speak truth in love, to act for justice, to grow in spirit and to care for the earth. We celebrate with open hearts and minds the creative power that sustains and transforms us. Now it is time for our morning offering. If you would like to donate electronically, please click on the PayPal link that will appear in the chat. There it is now. You may then email admin at kuuf.org to let us know if your donation is for one, the KUUF General Fund, two, the Minister's Discretionary Fund to help our members in need, or three, our monthly charitable giving recipient for the month of January, KUUF's partner church in Romania. 
You may also send a check to that address. Please write in the memo line to which of the funds you would like that money to go. If this is your first time here at KUUF, you are our guest, so no need to contribute. Let there be an offering to strengthen and sustain our community, which is precious to so many of us. everyone. I am Reverend Jessica and it is time for our children's story. So I invite the young and the young at heart to scooch a little bit closer to the screen. Today is the last day of Black History Month and for our service we are honoring Black women's history of the United States. And so for our story today I'm sharing with you the book Let It Shine Stories of Black Women Freedom Fighters. Now this is a large book, you can tell, so I can't read the whole thing. But it tells the stories of 10 Black women in the United States and the individual stories of these women together tell a bigger story about how Black women have fought for freedom. And not just freedom from slavery, but freedom from sexism, from oppression, and from being silenced and how they passed the torch from one to another through the 19th and 20th and into the 21st centuries. And we're gonna go through each one rather quickly because there are 10, but I hope if you see someone or hear something unfamiliar that after the service today, you Google their name and learn more about them. So let's begin. And I'm gonna share my screen. So you can see the pictures. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So we start with Sojourner Truth, who was born enslaved in 1797. She escaped to freedom and after that spoke out against the evils of slavery. Her most famous speech from 1851 at a women's rights conference asked the question, ain't I a woman? where she argued that civil rights and women's rights could not be separated. Oops. Oh, then we have Biddy Mason. She was also born enslaved in 1818 and she actually fought for her freedom in a court of law in California. She went on to become a nurse and a prominent businesswoman in the city of Los Angeles, owning land, running charities, she founded a black church there, and she made sure that all children in the Los Angeles area got a quality education. Next is a very familiar name, Harriet Tubman. She was born enslaved sometime around 1820 or 1821. Now she's famous because she was the most successful conductor on the Underground Railroad, helping to lead thousands of enslaved people to freedom. But did you know that she was also a soldier and a spy during the Civil War? And in one famous raid, she led an army of formerly enslaved troops who together in one night successfully freed hundreds of people.
And then after her, we have Ida B. Wells Barnett. Born enslaved during the Civil War, she became a famous journalist and speaker, and she traveled the world, confronting the hypocrisy of white feminism and bringing attention to the epidemic of lynching in the American South. She helped to bring about major changes in the laws, and she saved countless lives because of her efforts. Next came Mary McLeod Bethune. She was born in 1875, born free, but on a cotton plantation, where as a child, she had to pick hundreds of pounds of cotton a day. But she went on to get an education, become a teacher, and eventually opened her own college. She fought for voters' rights, civil rights. She was a journalist. She worked alongside several presidents of the United States. She did everything. And then we have Ella Baker, born in 1903. Now you may not know her name, but you know her legacy. She is one of the most influential people of the civil rights movement. And she often worked in the background because she didn't believe in putting one person at the top. And after my homily today, we're actually gonna play a song that uses Ella Baker's words as the lyrics. So pay attention to that. And after Ella Baker, we have Dorothy Height, born in 1912, who was also, also deeply influential in the civil rights movement. Her achievements are really too numerous to list. She was a protege of Mary McLeod Bethune and fought for voting rights and civil rights while working with senators and presidents to change the laws to make our country more just. And she eventually was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Bill Clinton. After her came Rosa Parks, born in 1913. We all know the inspiring story of activist Rosa Parks, who sat on the bus and claimed her dignity, which inspired the Montgomery bus boycott, as well as an entire movement for civil rights whose legacy of nonviolence continues today. Much of what we know about protesting and nonviolent actions, we learned because of the efforts of Rosa Parks and her contemporaries. And next came Fannie Lou Hamer, born in 1917, who, inspired by Rosa Parks, bravely fought for voting rights in Mississippi at a time when this put her life in real danger. She was hurt, she was attacked over and over again, and she continued to speak out. She never let herself be intimidated. And she went on to inspire Shirley Chisholm, born in 1924, who became the first black woman elected to US Congress. And in 1972, she was the first African-American and the first woman to run for president. And though she was not elected, her candidacy paved the way for Barack Obama and Kamala Harris. So my story was a little bit long today, but I thought it was important to spend some time showing how Black women have let their light shine and how this has changed history. And now we're going to take that inspiration and we're going to sing our song and we're going to let our lights shine. You guys ready? You guys ready? Okay. Let me get my guitar. And this, as we know, was a, fam a favorite song of Fannie Lou Hamer.
Nicely done. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. Now it is time for our joys and our sorrows. Though we are physically distanced from one another, our hearts and our spirits remain connected. When shared together, our joys are amplified and our sorrows lessened. If you have a personal joy or sorrow to share, I invite you to write it in the chat this morning and I will read it aloud. Genevieve and Morgan share a concern that our youngest cat's surgery is not healing as well as we would like. We send healing light to the youngest cat. Hope that they heal well. Samantha shares a sorrow that my beloved furry pup crossed over the rainbow bridge on Thursday. My joy is that I have wonderful friends who helped me through it. Sending you love, Samantha. Bunny joy for the time we got to spend with Matthias's grandparents who are now safely back in North Dakota. What a joy. OE sorrow for one of my clients who is currently in the dying process. Holding you both in our hearts today. Ginny shares a joy that Mark Sugimoto, MD, retires this week after 33 years taking excellent care of patients at Group Health Kaiser. Congrats to my dear husband. Congratulations, Mark and Ginny and everybody in the family. Congratulations. Maria shares, my mom got her second vaccine and my brother got his first vaccine. How wonderful. Ed Woods, in memory of Lee Bellis, a young man from Port Orchard who was killed in the first Iraq war 30 years ago this weekend, holding Lee's memory in our hearts today. Jane shares, Bob and I got our second vaccination. Yay, hope that everyone who wants it is soon vaccinated. That's a prayer that we all share, sending up that prayer. Kathy had a huge fight with my son. I need the energy to try and fix it. I have no desire to fix it. I am a tired parent. Sending you love and strength. Joe, grateful that mom's doing well after first of two cataract surgeries and has had her second vaccine. We all are resting easier. How wonderful. Melinda, thankful my mom's doctor found her a vaccine appointment. Congratulations. Guy has joy that a third vaccine was approved to help end the pandemic. Amen, Guy. We all are sharing in that joy today. Bonner, so glad to have discovered RNJ's smoked meats in Bremerton. <laughs> That's some good eating. We're taking our joys now where we can find them. So congratulations. <laughs> Marcy has joy and concern. My brother and his wife bought a house and moved out of my mom's house. She has her space back now, but concern about her being alone again. Holding you all in our hearts in your joy and concern. Lisa sending prayer and love to my friend Charlotte, 
who has battled cancer for the past year. Charlotte has been a mentor to countless teachers and students and has been an inspiration for so many. She entered hospice this week. Sending our prayers and love to Charlotte. Michael shares Mars joy. <laughs> Bunny, joy that my mom finally found a vaccine appointment. Amen. Lenny, my joy is that me and my dad, who's 87, both got our second vaccination this week. Congratulations, Lenny. And Ellie has a joy for a visit with my family in Tacoma. All are doing well. Hooray. So glad. Jennifer has a concern for many of my students who are struggling with complex issues and challenges in this pandemic world. Sending light and strength to all of the students and teachers right now. And Maria shares joy. My best friend got married yesterday to a wonderful man. Congratulations. Well, thank you everyone for sharing May you who shared this morning feel the love of this community surrounding you and holding you close. And for all of those whose joy or sorrow is too tender to share, our hearts are with you. May the spirit of life and love bring peace to us all. Amen and blessed be. When you were labeled that angry black woman, was that one of the things that knocked you back? Well, a that bit? was one of those things that you just sort of think, dang, you don't even know me. Yeah. You know, I mean, you just sort of feel like, wow, well, where'd that come from? Yeah. You know, and that's the first blowback because you think, wow, that is so not me. But then you sort of think, well, this isn't about me. <laughs> this is about the person or the people who write it. <laughs> No hesitation, Serena drifted back and the suck was lobbed just on the baseline. Carlos Ramos in the chair. If he gives me a thumbs up, he's telling me to come on. We don't have any code, and I know you don't know that, and I understand why you may have thought I, that was coaching, but I'm telling you it's not. I don't cheat to win. I'd rather lose. I'm just letting you know. So let's be clear. This is not a speech of concession. Because concession means to acknowledge an action is right, true, or proper. As a woman of conscience and faith, I cannot concede that. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected woman, person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. I've been trying not to be an angry black woman. Make sure I smile a little in public. It seems like the understanding is that our facial expressions do not lend to other emotions. At the fear is we stay ready to start a commotion just because. Like there are no reasons to be black. 
a woman and angry at the same time. So don't you know on most days I turn my smile into a protest, but the rest is a crooked upwards battle. I've been trying to rise like Maya's dust. Every time there's some bitter twisted lies. Been trying to be black girl magic without a spell to conjure over this hurt, this pain, this rolled up thunder pressed between my ears. I've been trying to sew invisibility cloaks to drape around my children for protection, only to find out they invisible already without protection. I've been trying to tell my daughters to not be angry, that sass might get you sassed, that kissing the pavement ain't better than going home. They will say you had too much attitude, refuse to see your smile pressing through from behind your teeth, the world on your shoulders like the mule you are. They will wonder how you made it anyhow, how somehow they haven't killed you yet being angry and all. I think what you're trying to ask is uh, why am I so insistent upon giving out to them that blackness, that black power, that black pushing them to identify with uh, 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 black culture. I think that's what you're asking. It's, it's, I have no choice over it in the first place. To me, we are the most beautiful creatures in the whole world. Black people, I mean, and I mean that in every every sense, uh, outside and inside. And to me, we have a culture that uh, is surpassed by 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 no other civilization. But we don't know anything about it. So again, I think I've said this before in the same interview. I think uh, at some time before, my my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. And ain't that the point? That Harriet Tubman had to be an angry black woman? That Sojourner Truth had to be an angry black woman? That Asada Shakur had to be an angry black woman? That Fannie Lou Hamer had to be an angry black woman? That Rosa Parks had to be an angry black woman? That Shirley Chisholm had to be an angry black woman. That Ida B. Wells had to be an angry black woman. That Coretta Scott King had to be an angry black woman. That Betty Shabazz had to be an angry black woman. And ain't that the point? That I have every right to be angry. Angry about our trees cut down and the roots left there naked in the sun. About history being his story one too many times. About the corrections to my language when my tongue was already cut out. About gentrification, about discrimination, about appropriation of my body, my colloquialism, my culture, about bullet spraying like a carnival game on victims with no weapons, about being called everything but my name, Mammy, Jezebel, Ratchet, Bitch, about the prison industrial complex, about this reflection someone put in the mirror that ain't my own. I have every right to break the glass. This anger ain't yours to police, ain't yours to cage up like a bird, ain't yours, it's the point. I've been trying not to be an angry black woman. Truth is, I ain't trying no more. And you gonna be glad one day. I said you gonna be glad one day. I was angry enough to change the world. My name is Fumi Lola Fogbamila, and I want to share a piece that I wrote for little black girls, and I call it Black Girl Fly. 
Imagine a little black girl, maybe nine, maybe 10. She solemnly swears to herself she will win. She will write her thoughts. She will read them loud. She will speak her mind. She'll be black and proud. She gonna light up the world with her futuristic vision about what our world would look like if we fought for abolition of the systems that are founded on a mass superstition that demand that our minds and our bodies are imprisoned. Yes, she gonna do all that. But in order to do that, she has to dodge the things that hold her back, like assumptions made about who she is and what she should do and how she should live. Like, be a good girl and don't make no noise and go play with Barbies and these pink-ass toys and your strength is no match for the strength of the boys and she knows that ignorance given power destroys, but she won't be held back. No, she won't do that. Yes, she will push through. That's what black girls do. And she has no limit. She exceeds the sky. She is strength and power that you can't deny. She will challenge authority. No, she won't comply. She will change the world. Yes, she will go. High, and I'll be shading my eyes as I look in the sky. What I see in the clouds, that young black girl fly. Get it, black girl fly. Go, black girl fly. Come on, black girl fly. Yes, black girl fly. And I'll be shading my eyes as I look in the sky. What I see in the clouds, that young black girl fly.
the mortar, stone, and trowel. We are both carpenter and beam. Each of us both architect and builder. Each of us the dreamer and the dream. Each night a child is born. Well, this month, in honor of Black History Month, the YWCA of Kitsap County has been celebrating the contributions of Black women in our county by posting on the YWCA Facebook page every day several brief biographies of Black women who have been influential in the history of Kitsap County. And I've been reading these biographies and they are deeply inspiring. And I wanna encourage you if you haven't seen them to go to the YWCA of Kitsap County Facebook page or their website later today or this week and spend some time scrolling through because it is fascinating and important history. And most of the women featured by the YWCA aren't ancient history, many are making history today. They are the women who are the inheritors of the legacy of all the women I spoke of earlier. And we have the opportunity now to support that legacy, that work, what they're doing for our county today, work we are all benefiting from. History is alive and the arc of the moral universe is long. And if we want it to continue to bend toward justice, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., we must contribute. And one of the women highlighted by the YWCA as a history maker is Karen Vargas, who is featured in the presentation that is happening after our service today. And I am thrilled that we get an opportunity to hear from her and I encourage everyone to attend that presentation. For our children's time earlier, I went through several stories of black women in United States history and I hope you noticed the arc of history in their stories, how each woman's contribution built on all the women who preceded them, how with their efforts it bent toward justice. It's important for us to notice how this happens because as we begin to learn our own Kitsap County history, we can imagine how we might be a part of the arc right where we live. And I wanna talk about local history and because Black women's history is rich and complex and defies a single narrative, I want to lift up just one story that feels foundational, and that is the story of Lillian Walker. When Lillian Walker passed away in 2012, the Kitsap son called her the soul of Bremerton. Born in 1913 in Southern Illinois, Lillian came to Kitsap County with her husband James in the 1940s during World War II when the Navy and job opportunities at the Bremerton shipyard brought a wave of Black migration to Kitsap County. According to historian John Hughes, who wrote a book about Lillian's life, Lillian Walker, Washington State Civil Rights Pioneer, Lillian and James were among nearly 10,000 Black Americans who moved to Bremerton during the war. And at that time, Bremerton was segregated. Sinclair Park was the only place that black people were allowed to live. When they went into town, they were met with whites only signs just about everywhere they went. Immediately, Lillian and James organized staged sit-ins and helped to found the Bremerton chapter of the NAACP. Lillian also helped found the YWCA as it began to focus on uplifting and serving women of all racial backgrounds. And she served as the secretary for the Puget Sound Civil Society, a civil rights organization. 
This was long before the civil rights movements of the 1960s. And I think it reminds us that there are so many stories in American history that we don't know. So many stories of seemingly everyday people who have worked so hard to make this country a better place and whose contributions have added up to the bending of that arc of history. The book I read for this sermon today, A Black Women's History of the United States, has story after story of women just like Lillian, whose, women whose names we know and whose names we don't, names who have been lost to history, who were demanding equality merely by daring to exist without apology, fighting injustice every day in large and small ways, fighting not just for their rights, but for their lives, all the while facing prejudice and hate, and yet insisting on being treated with dignity. Not one of their lives were lived in vain. All of them mattered. Lillian Walker said, either things were gonna change or I would have to move. After the war, after the whites only signs had come down, the Walkers didn't move away from Bremerton, though many Black Americans did after the war was over. Sinclair Park was closed and the Walkers had to fight to buy a house in a part of town that was still quietly considered whites only. Several years later, the Walkers were denied service at a Bremerton drugstore. And with the help of the court system, they fought this too and won. And this is Lillian's legacy never giving up, never moving away, insisting that this place right here was gonna be different. And her legacy of love and justice has been carried on in Bremerton by many, including by the Marvin Williams Center downtown and by Karen Vargas and the Living Arts Cultural Heritage Project. And Lillian's efforts not only leave us a legacy, she left a call to action. One of the things she said was, know your history and make a difference. How can we be part of that arc of the moral universe that bends toward justice in Kitsap County? Lillian told us, know your history and make a difference. Every February, we spend time learning Black history in honor of Black History Month. But tomorrow, once it's over, and our focus shifts to something else, let's not forget how Black history is always American history every month and how critical it is to know our history in order to really make a difference. And let us remember long after February is over that as Unitarian Universalists, we are still and always called to do our part to bend that arc. I've mentioned several places where we can learn our history, but I'm gonna say them again, just places to begin. There are lots of books and websites and information out there, but you can begin today by checking out the YWCA of Kitsap County website. Go to the Marvin Williams Center website and subscribe to get notifications of their events. Check out the book, Lillian Walker, Washington State Civil Rights Pioneer. And of course, you can read the book that inspired this service, A Black Women's History of the United States. And after our service, Erin Lydic of Kitsap Surge, Showing Up for Racial Justice, and Karen Vargas of the Living Arts Cultural Heritage Center will share what they know, what they've learned, and how we can not only support, but work alongside the history makers. It's wonderful to learn about them, to admire them, to honor them, but in order to make that difference, we need to shoulder some of the work of liberation. As a congregation in the spring, we'll be reading the Widening the Circle of Concern report from the UUA, which not only shares some of the lesser known history in Unitarian Universalism, but also what is happening now with Black, Indigenous, and people of color members and religious professionals. And what we as KUUF can do to carry on the legacy of people like Lillian Walker? What are the everyday choices we can make to ensure that our fellowship is a place in Kitsap County where everyone feels they can thrive? And today, as we particularly honor Black women, 
in American history, I want to name that the two poems you saw in the service today from D. Colin and Funmilola Fag Bamila, these were used with permission from the poets and both were fairly compensated. This is just one of those small everyday efforts we can make to honor the work of black women and to keep that long arc of the moral universe ever bending toward what is most equitable, most just and most loving. Because as authors Dana Ramey Berry and Callie Nicole Gross write, we owe a debt to the black women who came before us, those who persevered and those who did not because the totality of their history informs our present and readies us to continue to demand justice for black women and by extension for all. Believe in freedom cannot rest. Mm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Mm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it
And now it is time to set our intentions for the week ahead. I invite you to share a word or a phrase that will guide your heart and mind this week. And if you feel called to, put it in the chat and I will read them aloud. Family. Reconcile. Healing. Serve. Justice for all. Resist injustice. Energy. To honor. Keep strength to stay in difficult moments. Histories. Connection. Progress. Steady in the struggle. Morgan says music. Learn. Co-conspiracy. Take action even if you don't feel like working hard. Love our human family. Courage. Persist. Thank you everyone for sharing your intentions. Loving kindness, thank you. And now for our closing hymn, I Know I Can, performed by Elena Hemingway, Brian, Kenny, and Mike Menifee. Sister. 
Thank you everyone for being here today. Next week, we are honoring the one year anniversary of our physical separation. And I invite you to send me a photo or video of what you've been up to this past year so we can include it in the slideshow in the service. And please join us after this for coffee hour. The link will appear in the chat and you can click on that and go directly to coffee hour. The password is coffee with a capital C. And if you're too young to drink coffee, you're invited to attend the children's hot chocolate hour after the service for children and families. And the link for that will appear in the chat. And then today at noon, as I said, we're having our adult education class coming alongside with Aaron Dean Lydic and Karen Akuye Vargas, real talk about white people moving toward anti-racist ways. And finally, Today is officially the last day of the stewardship campaign. I encourage you to consider making a pledge if you haven't done so yet so that KUUF can move confidently into the next fiscal year. It's been a tradition the last couple of years to sing together at the end of stewardship. So today our post lewd is going to be a little sing along song. And though we are physically separated, we love our rituals. So I invite you to stay for that sing along and enjoy a familiar tune with a little bit of different lyrics. So let us extinguish our chalices. And let us close with these words from the Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson. Hush, somebody's calling your name. Can you hear it? Calling you to a past not quite forgotten, calling us to a future not fully imagined. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling our name. What shall we do? Amen and Ashe. And now for our postlude, come and make a pledge with me. The words will appear on your screen. Have a wonderful week, everyone.